let us go for questions now. Sitaram Bhai Patel Institute of Technology. Uh, good morning, sir. Yeah. So my question is related for SIM security information management. Yes. There is a one point of long time storage. Yes. Can anybody break the break the security of long time storage? Yes. It is very interesting. And uh, 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 let me just take you to a domain which is slightly different. Take hospital records, medical records. Now they also have to be stored for a long time, even though they are not computer network and it's similar. So what they do uh, is two things. One, of course, you want to store it for the long term, and therefore you need a lot of data and you need replication, duplication, and so on. So the cloud services and all you know. And to store it outside your organization is again risky because of privacy. That's why I went to the hospital and medical example. You do not want the service provider, whoever he is, to Reliance or Tata to read the data. So what do you do? This is a very interesting concept in security. It is called split your data. It's like the treasure island map. You might have seen it in the movies that there is a map where the treasure is buried. You tear that map into 10 pieces and give it to 10 different people. And only when all 10 of them come together and put their pieces together, they can really understand the data. Otherwise, each one is seeing a very similarly when you store long time your data in some other storage, you have to divide it into different parts. And each part alone will not reveal the full information, but if you assemble it back. So this is a very interesting concept. I will just leave it at that. And those who want should read this further. This is called M of N. That if M out of N people, if 10 out of 15 people combine, only then the data can be recreated. So this gives you some advantage of storing in a secure way in untrusted places. Store different pieces in different places. And as long as all of them don't get together to cheat, you will be able to preserve the data and also get your privacy. Next question. Morning, sir. My question is where open proxies is used and the advantages of open proxy? Open proxy is usually used only by bad guys. Okay. So a good guy, a good service provider will never allow his proxy to be used by unknown people. But open proxy, I, 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 let me qualify that statement a bit. There are societies which are open in the sense they are free, they do not want to disallow their citizens from doing things. So in such societies, open proxies are usually used by the bad guys. But there are other societies where the government is taking very strict action against citizens who try to read or learn or think beyond what is uh, prescribed as the correct way to live. So for such societies, providing open proxies is something that helps their citizens to, in some sense, overcome some of the restrictions. So these answers are more in the nature of political. From a technical point of view, an open proxy is not a profit making model and it is used, it is to be provided only if you have some reason for allowing unknown people to benefit by hiding their identity. I gave you some examples of why people would want to do things like that. But in general, like uh, Someshwar said, it's a misconfiguration. You have tried to configure a proxy only for students in your campus, and because you didn't configure it properly, others are also able to use it to hide their identity. Uh, morning, we have uh, asked the same question. Yeah. Uh, what does mean by birthday attack? Birthday attack. Ah, birthday attack. Now I understood. And okay. uh, uh, tell me, please, about the Chinese remainder theorem. The second one I will pass. You can read uh, by googling Chinese remainder theorem. Birthday attack, I will just give you a, a simple answer, which of course you can again read by uh, uh, Wikipedia and Google and so on. See, there is a very uh, interesting puzzle that in your room, how many people are sitting now? Maybe about 30 people. So can you guess what is the chance that two people have the same birthday? Just the date, the day and the month, not the year. So these 30 are random people. Actually, it's not random. You're all teachers. You're all having a particular degree. But assume 30 random people are sitting in a room. What is the chance that two of them share? What do you think? Is it a very low chance or very high chance? OK, so let me continue the explanation. That surprisingly, that if the number of people in the room exceeds 23 or so, there's a very high probability, more than 0 0.5, 0 0.6, that two people in the room have the same birthday. Even though there are 365 different days in which they could have been born, once the number of people exceeds 21 or 22, a clash is possible. Now, this principle is used when you do this integrity of files. When you hash files, many different files, if they are hashing to a smaller domain, that is why it is called SHA-128, SHA-256, how many bits you are using to represent the hash. And the smaller your hash, 
the more chance of collision that a wrong file can be mistaken for a right file because of the probability of clashing is quite high. So, this is called the birthday paradox and it is used in some scenarios to attack protocols which try to do a sort of integrity checking where you modify the message you can still make the hash come out right and cheat the person into thinking that the message is authentic you can compromise the integrity of the message. Chinese reminder theorem is a little more complicated you can read that later on yeah next question. Yeah, good morning sir yeah my question is related to OSIM uh, yeah. um, in the morning class we have seen uh, in the OSIM architecture so many modules yeah. And one of the module uh, which is particularly interesting to us is vulnerability attack. Yes. So, we would like to know um, something about um, what kinds of uh, vulnerability attacks it is presently checking for. Okay. So, uh, uh, many of you may be aware that ethical hacking uh, is the thing where a lot of professionals get together to go and check out whether a system or an organization is actually secure. So, many financial organization banks or uh, even uh, um, uh, uh, stock exchanges and uh, clearing corporation and so on, they have a compulsory rule that once in uh, three, four months, they have to get an independent third party to come and do a security audit. And those people use tools which check for vulnerabilities, that there are many known vulnerabilities that keep getting published. And that is what Ashok was trying to tell you, that a software that for instance, uh, Apache server or uh, SSL or a windows uh, software as people find out faults they keep reporting these and the uh, uh, manufacturer or the software uh, uh, writer releases patches and bugs. Now, most organizations find it very difficult to keep up with all this. So, they, know they do have a suicide team which is supposed to do all this there are supposed to be information coming in and so on, but never you can trust that you have done everything perfectly. So, vulnerability assessment tools are tools that are used by these auditors to go to a client's network, plug in their PC or laptop and it starts probing whether all the services available on that network are having any known vulnerabilities. So, this is the open VAS that he talked about, he gave the website, you can go and see and this sort of information is made available on a cooperative crowdsourcing basis to anybody to use. Just like for email sites which are known to send spam their IP address are listed. For viruses sites that web pages where viruses are concealed are written and therefore, a, like a parental guidance most proxy servers or mail servers can use such information or OSIM can use information like this available in a trusted forum developed for this purpose to block deny or prevent bad things from happening. So, this is what is meant by open vulnerability assessment. Uh, with the help of only using a port scanning, uh, please louder. When we identify the victim system, we will need to consult the IP table stored in a firewall. We will need to consult or we will need to modify. Okay, so, uh, I think let me explain the second part that what uh, Ashok was trying to say, and uh, you should also see this, this is a slightly more advanced usage that uh, the firewall has rules which you have configured to the best of your knowledge and ability, but OSIM is revealing to you that an address let us say from China is suddenly starting to send lot of data to you and your IP tables uh, the way you had configured originally was allowing that particular IP address to kind of contact your web server. So, what you need to do is react, react means go and add a new rule in IP tables. Now, manually we can do it, but that is a very slow process and if it happens in the night when nobody is watching. So, this is called a intrusion prevention system not an intrusion detection system. An intrusion detection system will simply find out something bad is happening and alert it. An intrusion prevention system will take the next step. Once it has found out that some IPs are causing trouble to me, it will go and add a new rule automatically in the firewall. So, the firewall will have an agent an OSIM agent which will then be able to reconfigure the IP tables, add one more rule, block this IP, drop the packet. So, that when it restarts the service, this no, a particular IP will be no longer able to attack you. So, this is an example of trying to prevent the intrusion automatically. Now, this could lead to false positives, it is slightly troublesome risky you have to analyze the effect of this, that a genuine customer may get blocked, he may then go away 
So, depending on the nature of your business and depending on the nature of this, the policies are set when to block, what is a false positive, how long to tolerate and these are judgment calls that as you become a security professional and start helping organizations, you have to use and configure the tool, so that you strike the right balance between keeping your organization safe. So, one way to keep your organization safe of course, is do not allow anybody to talk to you. Now, that is a very bad policy for most organizations, therefore, you have to do this balancing and that you will learn with experience. Yes. Hello. Yes, uh, go ahead. Morning sir. Good morning. Yeah, I am Shoaib uh, once again and here my question is like, if there are a number of requests coming from uh, same IP, what will happen is the first part, I uh, think that it will um, block the uh, OSIC system and what if I try to virtualize multiple IPs and generate multiple, uh, multiple requests like uh, DDoS or something like that, how much amount of traffic will it uh, let to pass at all at a particular time and then raise a threat alert? Okay, so uh, the first one you answered it yourself, but actually you should I just want to point out the converse that you cannot simply block an IP because it is generating lot of traffic because it could be a proxy server. For instance, IIT Bombay when 5000 students are surfing the internet almost all of their requests are served by two or three IP addresses which are the addresses of our proxy servers, the squid servers. So, a lot of address uh, requests keep going out from those few IP addresses only from IIT Bombay. And therefore, if a Gmail or a Google blocks it, then uh, most of us will not be able to access the service and uh, it is not a good healthy situation. Therefore, we have to be careful and you cannot block only based on number of requests. So, therefore, the analysis has to be a little more sophisticated. Now, the second question relates to that, that uh, answering that maybe I should just give an analogy, it is a spy versus spy. Okay. There are every scenario where you can think of which is a bad use or a DDoS could also be a legitimate use based on how other users whom you really want them to access. For instance, if you are Flipkart, if you just block then you are going to lose sales and if you do not block then you are going to get denial of service. So, I was saying this in the previous question also, there is no easy answer to what you are asking that there is no this is good, this is bad, there is no black and white and therefore, many times you have to make judgment calls and these judgment calls with experience the software can be trained and sometimes it makes better calls. This is the same situation in many information reasoning with uncertainty. When you apply for credit cards to banks, banks do not give everybody credit cards, they do a risk evaluation. If you are a young man driving a red car, red color car and so on, then you are more likely to cause damage, so they will deny it. If you are an old man and you have been, your children are married and so on, then you are less likely to be a risk. So, like that they use some guidelines and rules. So, similarly people use this, he said about IP reputation, right? Multiple IP addresses, all IP addresses are not equal. IP addresses used by university like IIT or used by some uh, government of India agency are probably more trustworthy. IP addresses used in a private subnet of a network of a commercial service provider are less trustworthy. And this is not only based on the owner. It is also based on the history, if attacks have been reported in the last two months from these addresses or this range, it is more risky. So, I do not want to elongate this answer little more, all I want to tell you is that this is what is called a multi-factor uncertain reasoning. There is no clear 100 percent guaranteed correct answer and these calls are taken by different organizations, this is called security posture. Some organizations take a very strict posture, if you are CIA or military or FBI, then yes, if you are different organization, universities take a different posture. So, please look for this, it is called security posture and such a policy is made by the CISO. So, if you happen to become the CISO of a commercial organization, you have to face all these tough challenges. So, I will stop this here and I hope you will enjoy the labs, we will come back during the labs and answer questions when you have uh, questions in each center. Thank you.